tonight that I'm going to lay a lot of guilt on you or something, and that's not the case. Uh, as I say, we are all ordinary people, and we are all missionaries, whether we're in Canada, in Newmarket, Bradford, Kitchener, Orangeville, wherever we are, as believers, we're all missionaries, that we're supposed to live on our own in such a way that there is a, a call to others, an appeal to others to come and uh, come to the Lord, find out what He has to has for them. And uh, as I show you this tonight, uh, we're going to take a little bit of time with the short passage, and then I'll show you uh, a number of pictures in our presentation, but we'll be done about a quarter after or 20 after so that we can have time for fellowship. You may have time that you want to ask us some questions after, more particular questions. And also, Carol has some uh, Korean ginseng candies here tonight that she'll be happy to hand out after. And uh, we always give this warning. You know, the first taste is like, kind of like dirt. It tastes like you pulled a carrot out of the dirt. You know, and you like to eat dirt, but you just got to keep going for a while. They're very healthy, they're very medicinal, but there's, it's not medicine or caffeine or anything like that. It's just ginseng is very common uh, herbal kind of cure-all for everything in the, in the East. And uh, the Koreans are very, very pleased with the fact that they have such good quality ginseng, even if it tastes a little bit funny at first. Well, living stones. Uh, I want to take a look at this just briefly. Uh, when we came back to Canada this summer in June, uh, the first place we went to was Palmerston, which is where Carol's mother lives. And that's over near Listowel. We also went to Listowel because Carol was born in Listowel, and there's an interesting stone in the cemetery, the Fairview Cemetery there in Listowel. There is the gravestone of a Livingston, one of the Livingstons. Well, you might say, well, which Livingston? Well, it's John Livingston, the brother of David Livingston, the brother of David Livingston. Then John Livingston Sr. Uh, was born in Scotland with David, but he came to Canada and he passed away in 1899 in Listowel. And there are a couple of the other relatives in the family there as well. So, uh, as a young man, he was challenged. As a young man, they said, would you like to be a missionary like your brother, David? He said, well, no, not really. He wanted to go to Canada and make a name for himself. And on his tombstone, all it says is, you know, John Livingston Sr., born in Tyre, Scotland, and so forth, died in this well. And on the tombstone, it says, he's a, he's a brother of David Livingston. So that's how he made a name for himself, by being the brother of David Livingston. And I, I point this out just simply to say, you know, if God lays it on your heart to do something for him, whether it is to be a missionary here in Bradford, working somewhere and sharing your faith, or to go somewhere else to another country, don't put that off. Let God work out his perfect plan and complete his purpose for you. You don't have to go overseas to be a missionary, but we all need to listen to the call of God, whatever he lays on our heart. So anyway, that was the Livingston, John Livingston. And then when we got back to Palmerston, uh, we said to Carol's brother, who's a builder, we said, you know, this summer, let's make it a little family project to finish the sidewalks along Grandma's uh, driveway there in Palmerston. So uh, John said, okay, that's a good idea. And he said, well, let's do it in flagstone. You know, flagstone looks nice when it's all done. And I uh, said, okay, sure, whatever. He knew what he was doing, and we, we were going to help him. So as it turned out, uh, we found out that doing a flagstone sidewalk is a lot of work. And it's very tricky because, you know, they're all different shapes and sizes, different thicknesses. And you, you basically get this big load of flat stone that you then got to look at and start laying down and thinking, well, okay, maybe this one will go here and that one will go there. And you don't want to do a lot of cutting and chipping because it's very hard to do that. You waste more, it's expensive. So you really want to lay them out as best you can at first. And it, it just gave me a whole new appreciation for people who do this. And also, I, I got thinking to myself, you know, the Lord is fitting us together as living stones in his temple. And, you know, we're all irregularly shaped sometimes. Our personalities, our talents, our abilities. And how does he do that? How does he know who to fit with who, to work with who, to be married with who, to be in a church and a chapel together? It's, a, it's really quite an interesting concept that God is fitting and shaping us all together. And I would like to just read these few verses from 1 Peter chapter 2 as we just highlight this idea. It says here, as you come to him, verse four of 1 Peter chapter two, it says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by man, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they are destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare <coughs> the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. <coughs> There's a few things that pop up out of this passage to me. The first thing I see is that Jesus is often rejected. The truth of the matter is he's rejected often by the world, and we might think, well, why? <coughs> He's done nothing wrong. He's done everything good, kind, merciful, helpful, but he is rejected. It's a spiritual war that's going on. And we should not expect that if we're going to stand up for God, we should not expect that everybody's going to accept what we have to say. We're sometimes going to be rejected. Sometimes we're not rejected. But there's, there's something that goes along with that. And that should not surprise us. The rejection of Christ does not stop Jesus from building that incredible, beautiful temple. He's going to continue to build it. He's going to add piece after piece, stone after stone. But sometimes we're going to find it's hard going, and we are going to reject it. The second thing I see is that, that the, the fact that he's rejected does not diminish the fact that he becomes the cornerstone, the capstone, the foundation. He's, he's really the key of the whole beautiful temple. And, uh, you know, someday we're all going to stand in his presence and we're going to say, my goodness, where did all these people come from? From all over the world, every nation, tongue, tongue tribe, language, they're all being fitted together into that beautiful temple. Jesus, though, is the central facet of that whole temple. And uh, we're going to be so thankful on that day that we gave our time and our energy and our resources and just our attention to Christ as we helped to build that beautiful temple. Well, the second thing I see here is that, you know, belief. In verse 7, it says, Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. You know, faith is connection with Christ. There's no other substitute. You can't say, well, you know, my parents were Christian, or my grandfather was a missionary, or, you know, I went to a Christian school. You can't say that. It's all still a personal connection between us and Jesus. Faith is absolutely essential. And in fact, the sad thing is, many people know all about Jesus, but never personally put their trust in him. You know, but for the one who believes, that's different. They're being fitted into that beautiful temple. Now, some people look at verse 8 and they say, well, you know, it sounds to me as if some people are kind of, they're already pre-planned or predestined or whatever. And I say, well, honestly, I don't know. And how could I know? I'm only a human being, you know. What if God decided that, you know, if you pray for that person for 10 years, and if you witness them as a friend, a neighbor, or a co-worker, whatever, after 10 years, you're going to get saved. You know, and you may think for 9 years and 11 months, man, that person's never going to get saved. You know, but maybe, who knows, on the 12th, or the 12th month, or the 10th year, whatever, all of a sudden they get saved. We really don't know, and we can't say, you know, somebody's not going to become a Christian later. Our goal is to be the savior of Christ, the son of Christ, to reach out to them. And hopefully they will come into the kingdom. And finally, you know, we realize that we are of the light. The world is of the darkness quite often. Not always. Sometimes in unexpected ways we'll see the light of the gospel. But in, as you can see in verse 9, you know, we're, we've been called out of the darkness into the light. And we need to realize that we're going to continue to be a light to the people around about us. Uh, sometimes that light is going to be a glare in their eyes. They won't want to look at it. But other times they will. They'll thank us <coughs> for the role we have. So I, I just encourage us in this little tiny short thought is just to you know, realize that God is building an amazing temple. We're being fit in like these funny stones here, the flagstone. We're being fit together. <coughs> God is doing it. Somehow it's happening. It's growing. It's going around the world. It's continuing. And we need to be sure that we're, we're useful in his kingdom to help build that great temple in the way we can. 
Well, let's take a look. <clears throat> let's take a look at Korea. <clears throat> we, uh, as you know, we live in South Korea. Well, you might say, well, I'm not even sure exactly where South Korea is. Well, you know, this is not happening for you. But I'm going to give you that one here in a moment. Uh, Korea is very much an interesting study. There's a lot of transformations going on, but there's been a lot of tension over time. And, you know, just time in general, long history in South Korea. <clears throat> so first of all, South Korea is nestled between you know, Japan, China, China on the left, Japan to the right. And this little, this little uh, uh, peninsula, which is now divided between North and South Korea, you know, it has a 4,000 year history, just like Japan and like China. China probably even more. And uh, over the years, you know, sometimes Korea itself was divided. It was divided into three kingdoms for a while. Sometimes they'd fight amongst each other. Or the Japanese would then try to invade you know, Eastern Asia, or the Chinese would try to invade Japan, or the Mongolians would decide to do something. They'd come down from the north there. You know, and, and Korea became kind of the, the, the walking path for some of those nations. And so the Korean people are very resilient. They've been used to a lot of hardship at different times. And they, they're very nationalistic, and they have a strong sense of identity. And they, you know, they're determined to be their own people. And that all plays into what God is doing in this little area world. Uh, it's a beautiful country right now. Of course, lots of rice growing and so forth. Uh, this summer in June, it passed 50 million in population, but as a country, it's, South Korea is 1% the size of Canada. So it's a very, very small country. Uh, economically, spiritually, in other ways, culturally, it has a lot of strength, and uh, definitely it's one of what we call the Asian Tigers of the East. There's a lot of developing nations in the East might be surprised. Vietnam is another developing nation. Of course, you've heard of Taiwan, and maybe you've heard of Malaysia, and Indonesia. All these countries are, are, t are starting to become quite a thing in themselves. Uh, but they all have different heritages, and they all have different cultures and religions. Indonesia, for example, is the largest Muslim country in the world now. Uh, South Korea is the, is the largest Christian nation in uh, East Asia. And uh, God has a plan for all these countries. So we're kind of going to take a quick look at a little bit of history, a little bit of what we're doing in the school, and uh, what the opportunities might be for the future. So if you were to go to Seoul, South Korea, you'd see a lot of contrast. You'd see a lot of big buildings, high rises, but you see also mixed in there some of the older style buildings, a lot of construction going on, roads, whatever. But uh, land is at a premium. And I was telling uh, Leon and Kathy this afternoon, I said, you know, even along the roads, in the ditches. You know, that's not waste land, that's very precious land to them. So they'll grow melons and cucumbers or tomatoes or something like that. You know, they use all the land because it's a small country with a large population. They need all that land. So there's very little waste of land and very little grass. Nobody has grass. Everybody lives in an apartment. You have plants on your balcony. Some people have a flat roof. <clears throat> so they put, you know, trees, plants on the flat roof, go upstairs and sit down in their little garden up on the rooftop. But um, for the vast majority, no lawn, just an apartment, you know, flowers, parking lot, all the rest. Over the years, as I mentioned, there's all these different kingdoms, so there's, uh, there's quite a lot of heritage and palaces and, and city gates and things like that you can see throughout the city. The traditional Korean clothing, we might say, well, that looks pretty Asian. You know, but they'll say, oh, it's not Japanese, and no, it's not Chinese, it's not Taiwanese, it's definitely Korean. And they have their own styles, and uh, they're very, you know, very, very, they hold to that very strongly. Uh, somebody asked me about the flag. What does the flag mean? Because uh, the flag has that funny symbol in the center, it has these little bars, and that, that was all from an old Eastern religion called Taoism. And basically, uh, the symbol in the center is yin and yang, which they, they believe are two forces, kind of like male and female forces that they think are at the center of the universe. And then the other symbols stand for earth, wind, water, fire, and so forth. But that's an older, older identity of Korea. In the modern era, there's been tremendous growth of Christianity. So we'll get into that in a few moments. If you like uh, delicate pottery or Asian-style pottery, the, uh, that pot there on the right is a porcelain that then has every one of those little holes is cut out. So that's a very, very fragile piece of porcelain. It's all kind of ornate and a lot of finesse. And they like to do things that way. They like to put a lot of time into some really delicate, fragile thing and just make it so. And it's part of that Asian finesse.